testing. Uh, so maybe for the tour de, de table, uh, Nicolas, you want me to say the names and you start introducing yourself? Yeah. So I'm Nicola Ferro from uh, University of Padova in Italy. And uh, uh, I, I co organize this initiative together with Khalid and uh, all the other uh, partners you will see around uh, the table. So I'm Khalid Shukri. I am running the activities of the European Language Resources here in Paris, and I'm very glad to be part of the uh, initiative. Miguel? Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Miguel Lamingo from the Universitat Politecnica de Valencia in Spain, and I'm one of the co organizers of the NT Translation of Brask. Alessandro? Hi, I'm uh, Alexandru Ciaușu. I'm working for the European Commission in the multilingualism team uh, with Philip. And I have some background in uh, natural language processing. Thanks. Guillaume? Hi, everyone. So I'm Guillaume Jacquet. I'm working for the Joint Research Center, which is part of the European Commission. And I'm uh, working on text mining uh, uh, topics. Thank you, Giorgio Maria. I'm, uh, I see another Giorgio, so. Uh... Yes, uh, I, okay. I'm Giorgio Maria Di Nunzio from the University of Padova. I'm one of the co-organizers of the Multilingual Semantic Search Task. Thank you, Vasily. Hi everyone, I am Vasilis Papavasiliou, working for the Athena Research Center in Athens, Greece. And I mainly worked on uh, data collection. For them to task. Maria? Hi, I'm Maria Eskevich. I work for Claire and Eric, and I'm one of the co organizers of the multilingual semantic search task. Mercedes? Hi, I'm Mercedes from Pangeanic, and I'm co organizing the empty task. Philip? Philippe Jolin, European Commission, heading the multilingualism slash language technology sector inside DG Connect, if you know what it means. But we're dealing with multilingualism and multiple languages within the, the Commission from a policy and, and research side as well. Thank you. And you will have a slot uh, to tell us more about that, Philippe, hopefully. Jean Maria Silvelo. Hi, everyone. Jean Maria, University of Padua. Uh, Basically, I'm a participant to the task and I marginally helped when needed with some organizational aspect, very, very minor. <laughs> Thank you. Denis? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Denis Dosso, a postdoc at the University of Padua. I work with databases and ontologies and I helped a little bit with the tasks, just a little bit. Luca? Hi, I'm Luca Dini. I work for uh, InnoRadiant, uh, which is a French company in the domain of uh, natural language processing, uh, and uh, we are uh, participating to the name identity extraction task. Thank you. Cyril? Rouen from the French CNRS. I am one of the organizers of the first task on the name entity recognition information extraction. Thank you. Marwa? Hello, I'm Marwa Hashsalah. I have a PhD in NLP. I work at ELDA as a project manager, and I'm delighted to participate to this, uh, in this uh, meeting. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Maurizio from the University of Cagliari, Italy. I'm an associate professor working in the Semantic Web and NLP, and I'm basically a participant to the information extraction task. Thank you. Luca Piazzon. Hi, everyone. I'm Luca Piazzon. I'm a research grant holder from University of Padua. Thank you. Thank you. For some reasons, uh, my gallery got changed, but I think now it's Thierry. Yes, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I am uh, uh, working with Cyril and Pierre on task one, but Cyril did most, if not all, the job. But myself, I was deviated to annotate. Uh, COVID document in German for, for the semantic search. I learned a lot about COVID-19. Thank you. Um, Alberto? 
Hey, hello everyone. I'm a PhD student from the University of Padua in Italy, and I'm, I'm a participant. I'll be presenting tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, Guglielmo, sorry hello, if everyone. I don't pronounce it the right way. Um, hi, I am uh, Guglielmo, and I am a PhD student from University of Padova in uh, Information Retrieval Evaluation. Thank you. Manuela? Good morning, everyone. My name is Manuela Sanguinetti. I'm from the University of Cagliari in Italy. I'm one of the participants uh, in the task one, the one on named entity extraction. Thank you. Diego? Good afternoon, everyone. I am Diego from SW Lab at the University of Cagliari. Like Manuela and Maurizio, we participated in the task number one. Thank you, Stefano. Hi, everyone. I'm a participant from the University of Padua and we uh, work on the information retrieval task. Thank you, Lauren. Hello, sorry, I wasn't expected my name to be in the list. Uh, I'm Lorraine Gurio from the University of Grenoble, and I'm just attending. Hopefully, I'll participate in future rounds in the IR information retrieval task. Thank you, Lorraine. Nice to have you with us. I guess we, we went through all the list. Is there anyone I didn't uh, give the floor to? Apparently it's done. Nicola, the floor is yours. So uh, I think that now it's the time to open the session and more than mine, the floor is for Philippe, who will give us some introduction about the scope and the purpose. Yes, welcome. And we'll try to, to share my screen screen Should if I on. manage to do it, if I can try and launch it. And I will ask you, do you see not only my emails, but uh, the main presentation? Do you see it? Yes. Yeah. As main, and I have to go. Okay. So, um, presentation of what is this about? Well, I think that's in terms of crisis, people know obviously what is happening, or at least after a few days or a few weeks or a few months, close to a year now, uh, people understand the problem. And uh, we have, as you know, in, in Europe, a kind of bigger problem than some other countries. As you know, I'm not going to say it's a problem. It's, it's a culture diversity, it's an advantage. But when it's a matter of transmitting information quickly and efficiently, uh, it can turn out to be a problem. Luckily, uh, compared to uh, 100 years ago or 200 years ago or 1,000 years ago, uh, there is technology helping. That's uh, what helps us discussing right now. But there is another aspect as well, which is the language technologies. Language technology that allow you, if, if only to, to use uh, the automatic translation, as an application which helps you transmitting information, but it's obviously go beyond um, machine translation. As, as you know, you are just in the, at the core of, of everything around it. Um, one of the aspects that we are running, I, I don't know if you know, but if all of you don't know, then you get a chance for, for these guys to know. We are also responsible in the, in the group for the e-translation building block, it's called. It's a support from, from the commission to provide um, machine translation, automatic machine translation, focusing right now on mostly the official languages of the European Union, so 24 languages. And when I say mostly is that we have added recently uh, Chinese, Russian, uh, Turkish, and just recently Japanese. Uh, it's, it's don't promote it too much because the first version of the Japanese is rather beta, but we have a, a new release coming soon, which will be uh, of better quality and then we will start to promote it. So responsible for e-translation, mostly focusing on, on administration uh, to support the transfer of information across administration. But we have also recently opened it to the SMEs and the partial, partially to the academics in order for them to be able to translate and to use transfer information. 
Okay, so that it sounds like easy, but it's a bunch of, of tools and, and solutions. So uh, we have got the translation API, we've got the translation uh, website for the people to upload files and the like. We also ask support to the European companies. We are also organizing a catalog of service of all if possible, European language technology providers. We also support the collection of language resources. And that's uh, part of it is for instance, ELRC share. We have uh, also run a few generic services. You will see a, li a list a little bit uh, later, but we have also supported research, of course, for the last 10 or 15 years. And uh, one of the last effort in research is the European language grid, for instance. So go and have a look to see what it is about. It's very interesting. It's basically trying to pull the resources, all the code and all the, the tools in, uh, around language technology in Europe. So to get, get really the European landscape. And we have recently launched a one-stop shop, which is one portal where you get the, the commission services. So the translation, uh, the, the catalog of service, a link to the data. And recently we launched two new services, one which is um, Twitter, uh, a support to social media translation. So you type your text, you translate it in two, three, four, 24 languages if you want, in order to ease the, the transmission and information in these, these languages. And we have also an name entity recognition service that we have launched recently. And of course, we are supporting the COVID-19 MLIA endeavor that is this about. Just a quick hint on the self-automatic translation project. These projects are around 1 million uh, funding around. If I take uh, one example that I'm usually taking, if I, because otherwise it would take too much time, that's the multilingual anonymization for public administration, MAPA, uh, which is run by several of you, which is really one of the, at the core of some of the problem that we are confronted, which is anonymization. And if you look at the GDPR and this exercise, this is a very relevant uh, project. Now, if you look at the Commission at large, or DG Connect, so the, the IT aspect of it, what have we done so far? Um, so first, first of all, we, we have free 128 million grant for research to address really the need, the social economic impact of the pandemic, which is a, a, a big part, and uh, we manage to free and to target the, the research on, on that, that issue. But we have also with a given success, which is increasing, uh, supported the mobile apps tracing across Europe. So you receive more and more around countries. So you would be able to, to tr transfer or to travel across countries and be able to, to anyhow use the benefit of the, uh, of the apps. Okay, we've got also some AI uh, technology deployed in order to support the, the fast diagnosis of COVID-19 in hospitals. We are also in the process of dispatching 200 disinfection robots in the EU hospitals. And we have also, maybe it's not known to, to a lot of people, but one of the largest endeavor in HPC, so high power computing, uh, to, to basically calculate and find the, the molecules underlying the COVID-19 and try to find the vaccine related to that. I try to go fast. Um, Obviously, the, the Commission acknowledged the, the, the support and the importance of language technologies. And it's, if, you, if you try to find the, the blog by our Deputy Director General, you will find basically the, the masterpiece there is the support to, to the COVID-19 MLIA exercise. So really, we are with you, we are supporting you. I have not said watching you. Huh? Uh, but I don't want to put pressure, but uh, but it's important to illustrate the importance of what you are doing, guys. It's it's amazing, it's efficient, and you are definitely more efficient than us trying to launch, start thinking, discussing with members uh, to launch a call in starting to do multilingual information extraction. Okay, that's basically in a snapshot what we are about and what I represent here. Thanks a lot for you, few minutes of attention. Done. Thank you very much, Philippe, also for being so effective. I don't know if 
Are there any specific questions for, uh, for Philippe from the participants or in, in the chat? Otherwise, uh, while you think about, we can we could uh, move on. Okay, let me check also. Uh, yeah. So uh, I think next talk is ours, Khalid. Uh, so let me share the screen. So can you see my screen? Okay. So here we, we will give a, a brief intro, overall introduction to, to this uh, uh, initiative. So uh, we, we, we all know or we hope to know where we are in this uh, global pandemic uh, uh, crisis. And we, we know how much uh, it is uh, impacting uh, on our lives so on all the aspects. Uh, one of these uh, aspects is uh, accessing uh, information. And uh, if it is uh, true in general that getting information from the internet is like uh, taking a drink from uh, an hydrant, uh, it is uh, even more uh, severe in, in the case of a pandemic, like this one, because of the volume, the spikes uh, in, uh, in the produced information, the problems of uh, trustworthiness of the produced information, and the uh, problem of multiple languages, because it's not just English information. We have multiple countries, uh, and we need to, to reach all the population, not only the English-speaking population. So we, we may think uh, that we already have search engines and that they, they are the solution. And this is for sure a great tool. And you can, for example, see how much Google has tailored and customized its interface for COVID-19 related queries. This is mostly made in, in, in some sense, but it is very, very useful. Anyway, even search engines uh, may have uh, problems and uh, there are studies uh, trying to understand if they are doing the right uh, thing. So, uh, for example, this uh, uh, study from Harvard University uh, found that search engines prioritize different categories of information sources in different ways. And for example, there are some search engines that put alternative media, uh, so social media or even misinformation uh, blogs before government related websites in their ranking, which is obviously uh, a problem. Another possible issues with search engines is randomization. This is usually intended for serendipity, to put something unexpected in your result list. But if due to randomization, I skip one relevant and important result, it is a problem. There are uh, also problems related uh, to languages, countries, cultures. So, for example, autocomplete in uh, different languages, query autocompletion may even lead to misinformation because, uh, uh, for example, for Spanish, they have found that uh, autocompletion could lead to misinformation about uh, hand washing, sanitizers, and so on. And obviously, this is uh, another severe uh, problem. A few uh, weeks ago, and uh, now it's continuing, we had uh, in, in, in the field this uh, uh, debate and the case about uh, timid uh, being uh, fired by Google for uh, this uh, supposed uh, paper not uh, properly, uh, not following the, the internal rules for publication, supposedly. But uh, one point, if you look at this uh, paper, uh, they 
uh, were saying that the shifts in language play an important role and uh, larger scale language models may not be able to catch the norms or the changes in uh, vocabulary uh, for minorities or new cultural norms. And this in some sense is true also in the case of the rise of pandemics when all the COVID-19 wave started, models were not trained or used to the vocabulary, the issues, the kind of entities we find in these contexts. I mean, mask was a generic thing uh, up to now, now face mask is very important from an healthcare problem for the whole population. So even what we consider an entity and what uh, uh, is not uh, can change. So uh, this kind also of ethical concerns uh, uh, or biases in, in large scale language models can uh, have really an impact in the case of uh, uh, reacting uh, and providing access in a pandemic context. So what do we need to, to react? Basically, we, we need systems, but to build systems, we need resources, language resources, training, data sets, and so on, because of the important role of artificial intelligence. And obviously, this is a kind of chicken and egg problem. How do you build? one without uh, the other. And evaluation challenges are uh, a kind of solution because uh, as you are not uh, having participated, they help you to build your system and uh, on the other end to build your resources and at the end of the cycle, so you have uh, both of them. So uh, what do the others do in this uh, context? One, one very important initiative is the CORD19 dataset, which is basically a very clean uh, version of several uh, biomedical data sources, PubMed, BioArchive, MedArchive, and so on. So basically, it's a very uh, good collection of uh, health-related uh, literature. And uh, Google developed a, a custom version of their uh, algorithms for uh, this uh, data set because they were uh, acknowledging the limits of the general purpose technology for uh, um, used for, for uh, search engines. And in particular, they, they were highlighting the fact that traditional syntactic keyword-based approaches cannot be enough and semantics uh, should be uh, added in this uh, context. Uh, then uh, our uh, friends in the US uh, at NIST organized uh, Track COVID, which is an evaluation activity very much like uh, what we are doing here, uh, based on the COVID, uh, the CORD19 data set, and it was organized in uh, rounds and they developed uh, this, uh, this collection. So, what is uh, the, the, um, the summary uh, of these previous experiences? Mostly they focused on one language. Uh, they focused on uh, one specific uh, uh, domain and task, which is uh, uh, scientific literature and medical uh, professionals in, in, uh, uh, at large. And they were focused on just one task, which is uh, search. So when we started to think about uh, this uh, initiative, uh, we uh, wondered uh, what do we need to do, what we should uh, aim at. And obviously, being uh, Europeans, uh, we targeted uh, multiple languages to account for the diversity of uh, the continent. Uh, we uh, considered a general public because it's true uh, that uh, the medical uh, doctors and uh, researchers in the field uh, need proper support, but also the general public in uh, the case of a pandemic needs as much support as possible from uh, research and institutions to get access to the right information for them. And we uh, focused on three tasks, 
uh, because uh, we consider that, that semantics is important in this context. So we, we focused on uh, an information ext extraction task, building blocks for the semantics of a sem on, on a semantic search task, retrieving information, exploiting that semantic, everything in multiple languages and obviously machine translation because you need to pass from one language to the other uh, to know also what happens in your uh, neighborhood countries or uh, in other European nations. And so this is uh, the main difference of uh, our approach with respect to what we have so far. I think now uh, I can yeah. take a lead and you tell okay. me next. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola, uh, for this uh, excellent introduction of the, uh, the context. As, uh, as you said, the, uh, the challenge that we wanted to address is uh, this focus on uh, information management within the COVID-19 pandemic uh, environment. And you have designed these three tasks, uh, information extraction, uh, multilingual semantic search, machine translation. And you see here the, uh, some of the key players that were involved in the uh, general organization. We will come back to the task uh, one by one. In, uh, in addition to the European Commission that everyone knows, the uh, ERA and CLARIN were involved. Uh, behind uh, Clay, you see the University of Padua in, in particular, and behind the European Language Resource Coordination, uh, we have partners like DFKI, ILSP, ELDA, and we also uh, uh, have the uh, GRC, the Joint Research uh, Center of the European uh, Commission. Next. Uh, I guess you, you have to uh, play the... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So with these uh, uh, three tasks, the first one was information extraction. I think the context, we, we have seen that. And the, uh, the main uh, objective of this first task and our colleagues uh, will, will come back to that was to uh, try and extract information on a number of uh, categories. And the uh, choice was on six categories that are listed there. And we tried also to be multilingual with a number of, uh, of languages that uh, were addressed. Uh, one, because they were uh, different type of languages and two, because we had the data for, and of course, this is not a, a close set of languages for the coming rounds. We will uh, see what are the, uh, the other possibilities. Next. Multilingual uh, search, this is the, uh, the other uh, second task that uh, we wanted to address. And the main issue for this one is uh, how to uh, search for health related content in different languages. And the idea is uh, what kind of high precision, high recall we can achieve with the uh, systems that uh, were uh, proposed both in a monolingual setting and the bilingual one. So that's the uh, second uh, option. And you see here uh, the languages that were addressed and the topics, the language of, uh, of the topics. The third uh, task, next. Uh, I'm trying to go fast because we need to, we are going to uh, come back to that with the uh, task organizers in detail. The third task is machine translation. As uh, Nicola said, it was very important to see if uh, citizens were looking for information in other countries. Uh, we all have seen comparisons between different countries in the way the confinement or lockdown was managed. Uh, we see that now with the way uh, vaccines are managed in different countries and in different uh, language that, uh, that report on these issues. And the idea was to see if we can uh, translate information from one language to another uh, in a very reliable way. And we will see uh, the, uh, the results afterwards. We have here a number of uh, pairs. Uh, unfortunately, um, all these pairs are from English to something. And uh, what we would like to do next time is probably to uh, have a different, different uh, sets of languages. 
uh, we have two uh, scenarios, constrained versus unconstrained. Constrained where we uh, allow people to use only our data versus they can use whatever and our colleagues will go into more, more detail. Next. So how, how this uh, first round uh, of the uh, challenge is organized. The first thing is that we thought that uh, we could have a warm up uh, phase, which is this first round where we get to know each other, we get to work together, uh, we uh, adjust the, uh, the timing, we adjust the uh, data format and everything. Uh, so that was the, uh, the first round. And hopefully there will be uh, two more rounds where we uh, try to extend the, uh, the data to extend the languages and maybe other, other issues. Uh, the uh, outcome of this, uh, of each round is what we call the rolling technical report. We would like uh, every uh, involved partner to report on what they do. And this is uh, in, in all the challenges. This is the critical and the most important piece of information, we want us to to uh, we want to tell you what uh, we did in terms of uh, organization. We want our colleagues who uh, worked on the data to tell us all the details. We want the system participants to tell us about how they developed their components, and the uh, organizers of the task to tell us how they measure the uh, performance of uh, each uh, system, and of course the debate around all these things. And uh, thanks to the University of Padova, we have this repository where everything is stored. And one of the uh, important uh, outcome of the, the whole challenge is to have a package with all the necessary information that uh, could be uh, the data, the metrics, the reports, the, uh, the systems that were, uh, were uh, used or at least the technology behind it. And all this is uh, what we call the exit strategy of the, the uh, initiative. At the end, this package would be usable by everyone. We, we hope that all what we did is, uh, is open, uh, both in terms of uh, open science, but of also open licenses and that people will get this. Those who didn't get a chance to participate for whatever reason will have access to this information afterwards uh, to, to make sure that they can still compare their technology to, uh, to uh, the uh, results that we, we did. Next slide. So uh, where we are now, uh, it was really impressive. I, uh, I don't think that we, uh, we expected this, although we knew that the pandemic was impacting uh, the life of uh, everyone uh, worldwide, but uh, 50 teams from 26 uh, countries, even if they didn't uh, really um, submit the runs, uh, all of them, uh, the interest that was expressed is, is, uh, is uh, important. Uh, we will see task by task how many uh, teams ended up submitting their uh, results. But we hope that because of the, uh, the uh, fact that this was the round one, and uh, as I said, it's a really a warm up uh, phase, people will uh, get used to the way of uh, running these challenges, the constraint that it imposes in terms of human resources, in terms of uh, of time it takes. Uh, we know that some people uh, trust uh, their postdocs to carry out some of the work. So this is really a preparatory phase where we can see uh, the, uh, the, uh, those who are interested and attract others. Here you see uh, how many uh, runs we got for each of the tasks and each of the uh, uh, context, uh, mostly uh, related to languages, but uh, our colleagues from uh, the information extraction, multilingual semantic search and machine translation tasks will, will tell us more. I think this is, uh, this is the main uh, information from, from the organizational point of view that we wanted to share with you. Uh, the next slides are about the uh, agenda and of today, tomorrow and uh, Thursday. Uh, we uh, try to stick this into uh, 
a very few hours per day to make the virtual meeting acceptable to all of us. Uh, I think we all uh, uh, we are getting familiar with uh, with Zoom and other virtual meeting organization. Three hours a day is uh, is uh, is uh, already too much. Uh, but uh, since uh, in in general we organize these workshops uh, during one full day of exchange, and that's the the good part of these challenges. We thought that uh, three hours a day over three days will give us more or less the same the same time. So I uh, I think uh, if you go uh, ahead to the last slide, yeah, uh, next one, yes, this one uh, here. Uh, I I'm not going to thank everyone yet, but you you see here all the colleagues who were behind the uh, organization. Uh, of each task and the data acquisition task. Uh, so we are very grateful to that. And I'm very grateful personally to Nicola because he really ran the coordination in a very efficient and very smooth, uh, smooth way. Uh, I, uh, I'm very glad that we have the chance to go through the descriptions one by one so you can see who were behind each of this uh, activity. Thanks a lot for your attention. Happy to take questions and uh, feel free to, uh, to discuss whatever uh, issues you feel appropriate. Uh, I hope that everyone is open-minded uh, with respect to this. And also feel free to share the information about the initiative uh, as much as, uh, as you can. Uh, we have addressed uh, a number of languages that are not necessarily European. And uh, which means that this is a really an international uh, initiative endorsed by European uh, authorities, including the European Commission, but feel free to spread the information uh, widely. Thank you. Nicola. Yes. Thank you very much, Khalid. Are there any questions? Let me check also on the YouTube uh, channel. No? Any comments? Uh, okay, so I think we can move uh, to uh, Guillaume mm -hmm. and uh, Stelios for uh, one of the building blocks of uh, all of this, which is uh, data acquisition and uh, engineering. Thank you. I think, uh, Stelios, if it's fine for you to, to start and... Stelios, your microphone is still muted. I see that you're trying to get it uh, open. I don't yeah, know if you have right. to do... Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, now yes. Yeah, we do. Okay, very good. So, Nicola, uh, uh, will you be presenting the slides? Will, uh, sorry, will you uh, be I can do it the if, slides? If you want, I can. Okay. Let me do it. Is it? And also, I have. So to... you need to share your screen, and Nicola needs to give you the right to share your screen. Oh yeah, that, ah. that all the participants have the rights, so it's not an issue. Okay. Where is it? Okay. Okay. So if you can, if you can go to the first slide. Ah, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's control L. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to the first one. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Guillaume. Uh, apologies for joining late. I was at another meeting. You know how these things uh, uh, are today. Um, so uh, for uh, in, in the next few minutes, I will be presenting together with Guillaume uh, the, the, the first building block of the MLI uh, EVAL uh, uh, initiative for COVID-19, uh, which is data acquisition. And um, uh, I will be starting first with uh, uh, one sub pillar of the data acquisition, which has to do with uh, the parallel data acquisition. This is work that has been done 
uh, by uh, our group in uh, in uh, ILSP uh, Athena Research Center, and uh, these slides have been prepared uh, uh, by Vasilis Pavasiliu and myself. Vasilis is attending uh, uh, the, the the workshop, and uh, Vasili, please feel free to to uh, to jump uh, whenever you feel uh, appropriate. Uh, next slide, uh, Guillaume. So uh, when uh, when the pandemic uh, broke out, uh, one thing that became uh, prevalent uh, is that uh, uh, time time was uh, really critical. So uh, unlike other cases of data acquisition, where you have the luxury of uh, uh, designing your data collections and engineering them in the appropriate way. Uh, for the uh, MLI uh, a COVID-19 uh, case, uh, we felt that we had to take all possible shortcuts in order to simulate uh, a very quick response of uh, the language technology community and in the particular case uh, that we're discussing here of the machine translation community to, to an emergency situation like the, the, the coronavirus 19 pandemic. So uh, we set off uh, by directly focusing on uh, medical uh, and health related uh, data sets that could be sourced from uh, well-known uh, uh, web sources. Uh, one could conceptualize it as a first step of, uh, of domain adaptation. And then uh, we uh, decided to enrich this uh, initial uh, medical and health related uh, uh, data collection with COVID-19 specific uh, parallel data in, uh, in, in a manner of uh, deeper, uh, let's say, domain adaptation. Uh, next slide, um, uh, Guillaume. Right, so uh, uh, to, to achieve this, uh, we first generated an updated version of the so-called uh, EMEA corpus. Uh, EMEA stands for the European Medicines uh, Medicines Agent, uh, Agency of uh, the European Commission. So uh, we harvested the website of the European Medicines uh, Agency and we applied uh, new, uh, we feel a bit more robust uh, uh, and efficient methods for text extraction from PDF files, uh, essentially an enhanced version of the PDF box library, uh, identifying uh, sentence pair in, uh, in a more uh, uh, intelligent and robust way by using the laser uh, toolkit, and uh, uh, then applying some sort of uh, parallel corpus uh, filtering. Uh, Moreover, um, medical-related multilingual collections, which were offered by the Publications Office of the EU, uh, uh, particular uh, um, agencies of the European Parliament, uh, uh, etc., uh, were processed in, uh, in a similar manner and increased the volume of the so-called, I mean, uh, general medical subset of, uh, of the training data. Next slide, uh, uh, please, Guillaume. So then uh, for uh, deeper adaptation, the first step in acquiring COVID-19 related uh, data uh, consisted in, uh, in the identification of uh, multilingual, bilingual websites where such content uh, would, be, would be residing. Uh, with the aim of constructing data sets that could later on be made publicly available, uh, not only for the shared task, but uh, the shared task purposes, but also more generally, we targeted websites of uh, national authorities and uh, public health agencies. Uh, and uh, where do you find these things? Uh, there is a list that is available from uh, the ECDC. This is the European Center for, for Disease Prevention and Control. Um, and then uh, we expanded, uh, uh, let's say, uh, this initial list with uh, 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 websites uh, from other EU agencies and uh, specific broadcast websites like uh, Vox Europe, uh, Global Voices, uh, Volturnet, uh, uh, and so on uh, and so forth. 
uh, this was uh, the plan for uh, for the first round, and uh, we are happy that uh, it has been it has been accomplished. In the next rounds, uh, uh, we plan to to include uh, relevant data from several other international organizations and uh, outcomes of uh, broader crawls uh, from uh, uh, dynamic or uh, non-dynamic uh, from sites with dynamic or non-dynamic content. Uh, next slide, please, Guillaume. Thank you. Uh, for acquiring uh, domain-specific bilingual corpora, uh, the tooling that uh, we used was uh, a recent version of uh, the so-called uh, ILSP Focus Crawler, ILSPFC in short, uh, which is a toolkit that integrates modules for, as you see on the slide, for uh, text normalization, language identification, document cleanup, text classification, bilingual document pairing, and, uh, and sentence alignment. Uh, as uh, as uh, we mentioned before, uh, we did not have the luxury of uh, running uh, the whole process. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, end to end uh, in uh, in uh, the theoretically uh, 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 proper and sound manner. So we adopted the rapid approach. Uh, so for text classification, uh, we relied mainly on uh, on uh, keywords that uh, appeared in uh, the several documents and pages and we kept only the documents that were strongly related to uh to to to, to the current uh, pandemic uh, uh crisis next slide uh, please so uh specifically for uh, sentence pairing uh, uh we we did not use the sentence alignment uh, uh, services that are already integrated in uh, the ILSP focus crawler, but we used uh, we used laser. Um, then we applied several criteria on the aligned sentences to automatically filter out uh, sentence pairs uh, that uh, might uh, present alignment or uh, translation issues. So uh, we, we filtered out uh, those uh, pairs with uh, scores uh, that were uh, lower than a predefined uh, threshold. Uh, uh, likewise, we uh, we excluded, uh, we removed uh, those, uh, we filtered out those uh, pairs that uh, we believed were uh, of limited use for uh, training empty systems uh, like uh, duplicates, uh, identical segments uh, in a pair, so numbers on uh, on both sides of uh, the pair and so on and so forth uh, hoping that uh, the, the 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 resources that uh, we would generate would be uh, really uh, high precision uh, uh, language resources uh, next slide please uh, guillaume so uh, uh, in the end uh, the size of the constructed data sets uh, varies from uh, um, uh, 800,000 um, uh, translation uh, pairs to 1.1 million uh, uh, sentence pairs, translation pairs. Uh, out of these, uh, the general subset covers uh, more or less 80%, while the COVID-19 specific subset covers 20% uh, 20, 20 of, uh, of the whole collection. And uh, you see the numbers, which are not surprising. I mean, uh, you expect uh, 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 more or less uh, this sort of distribution uh, in the different language, uh, language combinations. Uh, the organizers of the machine translation task that we'll, we'll be presenting the particular track, uh, track uh, a bit later on, uh, split them into training, validation, and test sets per language pair. And uh, these data were made available to all the participants of the of the shared task. Uh, and, and, and this completes uh, uh, the short, uh, let's say, description of uh, the parallel data acquisition uh, uh, exercise. All these uh, parallel uh, data sets uh, are, uh, are available uh, from the MLIA eval uh, website, but they are also available from uh, uh, the ELRC share uh, uh, repository. The ELRC share repository can be accessed uh, at uh, elrc-share.eu, uh, uh, and uh, there uh, we, we we first upload and document, um, if you will, uh, each and every data set. And 
Uh, then from ELRC share, we package uh, the training, we package the, 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 the data sets that are made, made available for the particular uh, share task. Um, in parallel to that, the data acquisition exercise, thanks Guillaume for uh, moving uh, forward, Thanks you, thank you. Uh, in parallel to that, the uh, data acquisition exercise also included uh, data acquisition for uh, information extraction and multilingual search uh, purposes. And uh, uh, for uh, this particular strand, uh, we relied on a very useful uh, 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 collection that uh, is the result of uh, a long-standing uh, service that is offered by the Joint Research Center uh, of the European Union. And uh, th this data set is called Medicis and all the details about uh, Medicis and uh, how we have uh, used and processed uh, the Medicis uh, data will be presented by, by Guillaume. So Guillaume, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stelios. Um, so as you said, now I will focus on the other data collection, which is more focusing on the two other tasks, which are information extraction and multilingual uh, semantic search tasks. And as you said, uh, the data collection you had access to uh, was uh, created based on a data set, which we called uh, Medicis COVID-19 data set. So I will describe uh, this data set and um, I will mention also the post-processing uh, which have been done by Estelios after. So I will try to be short, but I think it's important to remind from where this data set comes from. So I will um, present you the system which has built this data set, which is called the Europe Media Monitoring. EMM, which is developed inside the Joint Research Center, which is part of the European Commission. Um, so the idea of this system is to uh, collect, to extract information from text and uh, from a large amount of uh, data, mostly um, uh, text coming from media, collect this data, enrich with meta metadata this uh, information, this uh, text, do some selection and present it to uh, different uh, users and uh, uh, institutions inside and outside uh, Europe. So the principle is to collect per day 300,000 uh, news articles from 70, more than 70 different languages from a large amount of different sources, process them, extract information, and then deliver this information via different visualization tools adapted to the different uh, needs. The kind of metadata we extract are uh, from, okay, the language detection, uh, some categorization of the text, some entities extracted from the text, some geolocations, uh, quotes, sentiments, and some other uh, metadata. Uh, this is just to tell you that uh, it's not just a toy, but it's really used by a large amount of institutions inside and outside Europe. So it, it is something which is uh, daily used. Uh, there is a sub uh, model um, of EMM, which is called Medicis, uh, which is focusing on health domain with the same, same principle of uh, collecting information from uh, large sources and uh, extracting information from it. So the, the data set I was talking about has been built based on this system. And here the idea was to uh, give access to the community to this metadata we extract with a focus on COVID-19 and the first data set we, deli um, we delivered was on a period of time which is from December 2019 to April 2020. Uh, the metadata we made access to are the one I mentioned before, entities, categories, etc. Uh, with some limitations, um, uh, the fact that uh, we couldn't deliver the full text ourselves as a European Commission because of intellectual property uh, reasons. Uh, but Stelios made some post-processing to, to still make accessible this, uh, this text. 
Um, and also, of course, this metadata uh, is based on algorithms, so by definition, it's incomplete and possibly noisy. Just a few numbers on this uh, data set. One month of uh, this uh, uh, system, uh, this medicine system, corresponds with a focus on uh, COVID-19 to 4.1 million of news articles from 76 different languages, a bit less than 40 million mentions of entities inside this text and some other metadata. So this data set itself is available by itself uh, on the open data portal, ODP. And um, then for this uh, shared task we talk about today, there were some post-processing uh, done, thanks to Stelios, to, uh, from this data set, extract some additional information. And that's the, um, the data collection, collection you had access to uh, when you worked on these uh, shared tasks. And uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much, Guillaume and uh, Stelios. Um, so uh, there is a question from uh, Shadi on the YouTube uh, uh, stream. He's asking if the purpose is to provide all resources and publicity, what was the point of protecting data with a password that was given later to participants? So if you have any yeah. comments or I, I could start answering this question and maybe uh, you, you, you can add. So yeah, we go are... Ahead. Hmm? Yeah, go ahead, Nicola. Yeah. So we are providing open source uh, under CC BY license, all the resources we produce ourselves, which means topics, ground truth creation, so labels, uh, entities, uh, runs, reports, uh, scores, uh, performance figures, analysis, whatever. Those are in, in the open repositories, uh, open for everybody as soon as we produce them. And we add them in an incremental way as we go. The only part which is password protected are the corpora, because uh, as Guillaume and Stelios explained, they are crude from someone else's uh, sources. So uh, there may be copyright implications, uh, which they know better than me, I must, uh, I must yeah. admit, but uh, having uh, uh, a password protected part also means that when you register with, uh, with the initiative, you take some commitment, you see that there is uh, the participation agreement when you register and then you get it also by mail and you could commit to not reuse someone else's resources and, uh, and so on. So basically the motivation is to protect those uh, who are uh, allowing us or uh, not complaining if uh, we uh, use uh, yeah. stuff gathered from them. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Nicola, Nicola, if, if I... Uh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, sorry Stelius. I just yeah. add two, yeah. a couple yeah. of words about mm -hmm. that. I think, I think we, we wanted also to distinguish those who are participating to the challenge as part of the team that you see here today. So these people have access to the data. Uh, we made sure that the, uh, the data is protected uh, while we were clearing the, uh, the rights of, uh, of third parties, but mostly because we wanted the data to be only available for those who want to be with us today and this week and report on their activities. Once this challenge is over, we will open it to others so they can uh, reuse the data, try to see what they get out of this uh, afterwards but basically they will not benefit from all the brainstorming that we are doing, all the exchange that we are doing and so on. So in one hand, it's restricted to only the participants for some time. It will be open for everyone afterwards. So you can only get the data and get all these reports and all this now if you are part of the participants. Stelios, you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, just uh, I, I, you, you, you covered most of uh, what I wanted to say, Khalid. Thank you very much. Uh, regarding the machine translation related data, uh, uh, there are, I mean, m most of the data uh, that are um, rather not all of the data 
that are uh, uh, IPR cleared uh, are available through ELRC share for, uh, for download for uh, whatever other purpose uh, one may want to use them. Uh, and as Khalid said, for, uh, those, uh, for, for, for those portions of the monolingual data uh, that were uh, pro that, uh, for the copyright status of which uh, was, uh, was unknown to us, uh, for that portion, uh, LRA undertook uh, uh, an expedition uh, for uh, clearing um, uh, the IPR uh, by writing to people, uh, 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 etc. This process uh, is uh, more or less ongoing, uh, Khalid, I believe, right? Yes, yes, it is. Going yes. On. Yeah, yeah. Good. Thank you very much, everyone. I uh, I don't know if there is other questions in the uh, in the uh, YouTube. I'm on the YouTube on another platform, so let me just. Uh... Oh, there are no other questions on, uh, okay. on YouTube. And uh, guys, we are incredibly on time. That that's surprising. Uh, we are very good. So if. Uh, there are no other questions or comments uh, or something else uh, we wish to share. Now we would have uh, a 10 minute uh, break in, uh, in the agenda. Okay. Which means that we stop for 10 minutes and then at half past three, we, we come uh, back here. Half past three, then it's uh, in eight minutes, we, will, we are going to be back. Yeah. Thank you very much. See you. you in five in few minutes then. You Thank don't you. have to close the connection. I think we can just uh, yeah. mute our microphone and come.
I guess we are all back, or almost all of us. Yes, sir. So maybe maybe just a, a logistic thing, as I told you, Nicola, uh, for those who uh, don't want to be part of the recording, uh, in well, instead of uh, asking us to cut the pieces later on, which we will, of course, do, it's more easy if you just uh, uh, close your microphone and, and video and ask questions using the chat. Uh, but if there is pieces uh, that uh, you uh, think that we should remove from the recording, we will do that. Shall we move to the next uh, session, Nicola? Yes, which is uh, the uh, overall overview of uh, the major outcomes from uh, the three tasks. We will have uh, three talks in, uh, in a row, one for task one, information extraction, one for task two, uh, sorry, task three, machine uh, translation, and finally, uh, the one of uh, task two, which is a multilingual uh, semantic search. So I think that uh, Cyril could uh, start. Okay, so... Uh... Let me know if you can see the presentation. Now it's full screen, perfect. So it's okay for uh, all of us? Yeah. Okay, so uh, can I start now? Yeah, sure, thank you. Okay, so welcome everybody. This is a presentation of uh, the information extraction task for the first round. Uh, this work has been done uh, with uh, Thierry de Clerc at DFKI in Germany and Pierre Zeigenbaum and myself at uh, CNRS Listen. So Listen is the new name of our lab uh, instead of LIMSI. So the main objective of this first task is to identify relevant in medical information in text related to the COVID-19 issue. And this is uh, the conclusions for the first round. In uh, October 23rd, we gave access to the training data, but those data were unannotated. Uh, we collected 32 registrations from 17 countries. And in November 27th, the submissions were due. As previously presented by Khalid and Nicola, we worked on six types of information and uh, our definitions are based on the semantic types from the UMLS. So we considered relevant work on those categories of information. So first on drug names, treatments, and general interventions. So it could be commercial drug names or generic drug names. Uh, you have a few samples here. And general interventions is uh, quarantine, uh, so global activities that could uh, be uh, beneficial for the, as a treatment. The second category is concern signs, symptoms, or diseases, uh, so shortness of breath, extreme fatigue, fever, skin infection, weight loss, uh, all kind of information in those categories. The third one is about findings, efficacy of treatments. It could be positive or negative ex effects, it could also concern unexpected stuff. The fourth category is about tests. So all tests we can do, uh, such as blood sample or serological tests. The fifth category is about behaviors, everyday life actions, such as to wash one's hands, uh, to cough into his elbow, uh, to self-confine, the use of facial mask and physical distancing. And the last category is about all legal dispositions, regulations from local or national authorities. It concerns employer certificate, the list of authorized move uh, or the, the border closure. We reuse the same data set as the one from the machine translation task in order to mm -hmm. allow the participants to work on 
all tasks and on the same data in all tasks. So we worked on seven languages, English, French, German, Greek, Italian, Spanish, and Swedish. Uh, on this table, you have the number of files in the training and the test data set. Uh, so from nine to 12 files in the training set, from five to 52 files in the test set. Uh, I will explain later why there is more files in the test set. But if you look on the number of sentences between train and test, you can, uh, you can look and uh, see that there is no more uh, sentences in the test than the, in the train. So the reason why uh, there is this difference is the, the following one. Uh, all sentences from train and test data set have been extracted from the TMAX files. Um, there is several points. The first point is that sentences are not related together, so the sequence of text is lost. The second point is that there is no annotation available, so it could be uh, a good point, but also a bad point, so it allows participants to find their own content based on the general definitions I gave previously but it doesn't allow to train system based on existing annotations. So unsupervised systems could be used, but no supervised system. And the third uh, negative point is that for the evaluation process, we cannot rely on the gold standard since we do not have annotations. For the test data set, I split the files uh, into sequence of 2,500 sentences. So this is the, the reason why there is more files, but less content. This is uh, some uh, sentences in uh, English, Spanish, and Italian, uh, where you can see that there is uh, a few contents which is parallel between all languages, uh, as an example, between English and Spanish. Uh, so within those sentences, information must be found in the six categories previously defined. At last, we have four participants. Uh, two teams were from company, Accenture and Innoradion, and two academic teams, uh, SW Lab and Zhao. I'm not sure of the pronunciation. Uh, Accenture work on English and uh, submitted one run, Inoradion on English with two runs, SW Lab on uh, English and Italian with two runs for Italian, and uh, Joe on four languages, German, Greek, English, and Spanish with one run per language. In order to produce the evaluation, uh, we made a rover uh, at the character level. So in this tab, you have several columns. Uh, the first column is the offset of character. So uh, the, uh, the number of character uh, from the beginning of the file. Here you have the text. So we can see spread of COVID. And then the four columns for the four participants and which kind of predictions each system made on those uh, characters. So as an example, on the word spread, the team number three uh, predicted the findings. On COVID, the first and the third teams predicted sign or symptom or disease. In order to produce the rover, I kept annotations shared by at least two teams. So I didn't keep the findings in the rover, but I kept sign or symptom disease on COVID in the final output. So the rover has been produced on a combination of all submissions made by the participants. Since we have four participants, we have four outputs in the, in the rover, uh, including participants that submitted several runs. The reason is that we do not want to give more weight to predictions made in several runs by the same participants. So for each team, uh, among all runs provided, the majority prediction made was kept in the combined version. 
And in the rover output, I kept the annotation if it was shared by at least two participants. So this is the first kind of evaluation made on English. But I, saw, I also worked on a second kind of evaluation, uh, making a manual gold standard annotation. So this is a proof of concept since I only annotated nine files. Uh, I selected the most annotated files by all participants. So only one annotator. So that's not good because I cannot compute any inter-annotator agreement. So this is only my vision. Uh, the result is composed of uh, 1,740 manual annotations, and the distribution between all categories is the following one. Uh, we have uh, a huge number of signs, symptoms, and diseases, uh, a moderate number of behavior, legal rules, drug treatments, and a very low number of medical texts and findings. For the evaluation in other languages, this is impossible to produce a rover for German, Greek, and Italian, since only one participant worked on those languages. Uh, and we have nothing to evaluate for French and Swedish, uh, since uh, there is no participant on those languages. So the results are the following ones. So for English only, uh, using the rover process and results are presented in terms of precision. Uh, we have for each of the four participants, the number of predictions, the total number of predictions, and then the precisions for each of the six categories and the overall results. Uh, we can see that there is two participants that made a lot of uh, predictions um, and uh, among all those predictions, there is a lot of common ones uh, for the, the main categories. Uh, the findings was a very difficult category to find. The second evaluation on English is based on the nine files uh, we manually annotated, so the gold standard results. Uh, for this evaluation, I kept all submissions, so InnoRadion made two submissions, SWL made three submissions. So we have the number of predictions for those nine files and the results we can compute. Uh, so we can uh, consider that uh, findings is not relevant since there is only one information to be found. Uh, and for sign or symptom or behavior, it depends on the participants and the number of predictions that have been made. Among all methods used by the participants, and participants will present their methods on Thursday, uh, they are based on part of speech tigers to detect boundaries of information to be found. Uh, and one participant used BERT models to annotate entities based on the spans of text that have been detected by the part of speech taggers. <clears throat> Sorry. Another participant uh, used the OK Graph library uh, developed at the University of Cagliari, uh, which is composed of word embeddings and unsupervised algorithms. And another participants use the C text name entity recognition tool plus the UMLS terminology service to, uh, to find uh, the category of entity. So a few, uh, a few points to discuss. Uh, in the first round, there were no annotations available. So it could be a positive and a negative point. So this is negative since there is no training data for systems. Uh, many teams registered but didn't participate due to this lack of annotations. This is a negative point for the evaluations, but this is also positive. Uh, if we do not have gold standard, this is not a problem if we have several participations in each language. Uh, and this was only the case for English, so we can compute a rubber on English only. Uh, a positive point is that the results are similar between the rover and the gold standard evaluation. So based on those two kinds of evaluations, uh, we succeed to obtain uh, similar results. So the, the method is, uh, is correct. 
Uh, and there is a similar understanding of what kind of information to annotate uh, across all participants. So uh, since our definitions were very uh, limited with a, a limited number of uh, examples, uh, this is interesting to, uh, interesting to notice that participants consider the same kind of uh, what could be an information uh, in terms of entities and boundaries of entities. Uh, so for the first round, uh, this is what we can do, what we can say uh, about all those uh, results. Uh, and for the second round, uh, we expect to use new data and we hope to have uh, more context. Uh, we also hope to have gold standard annotations, uh, not for the trained data set, but at least for the test data set. Uh, and to conclude, uh, many thanks for the participation in the first round, and we hope that there will be also participants uh, in the second and third rounds uh, in information extraction tasks. So it's okay for me. I don't know if uh, Pierre or Thierry uh, want to add something else. No, sir. Perfect. Many thanks. Perfect. Very well. Thank you so much. I, uh, I'm sorry, Pierre, I didn't see that you join us during the Tour de Table. Uh, do you want to say just a couple of words about uh, yourself? Um, yes, so I'm a researcher, senior CNRS researcher at the, the same lab as uh, Siri, LMC, now listen. And um, uh, as uh, Thierry said, uh, Siri Livito, so uh, congrats, Thierry. Thank you very much, uh, Pierre. Uh, one of the issues that, uh, that uh, Cyril mentioned is the fact that uh, in, in a, at least a couple of languages, uh, we have worked out the data uh, as it is without the annotation, et cetera, but we had the data, we had the topics, but we didn't have participants. I think we should consider that the assets of, uh, of the challenge is also the data. Hopefully this will be uh, reused by uh, next round uh, participants. I, I see uh, here a question on the, uh, on the YouTube uh, from Danielle. Quick question, is any participant creating a graphic user interface for this tool? Uh, I don't know if this is uh, fact, understandable. Yes, that's understandable. Um, so we ask the participant to produce outputs using the BRAT annotation format. So uh, this format can be used by the BRAT annotation tool, which is a web-based annotation tool. So you can uh, download for free the BRAT annotation tool and uh, using it on your laptop and uh, it allows you to uh, visualize all uh, to visualize all annotations. Okay. I have uh, one question, uh, Cyril. Do, do you think, uh, uh, or looking also at the participant reports, uh, etc., what the participants can tell this uh, to us? Uh, do you think that there are any barriers of entry? for this uh, uh, task, uh, I mean, anything uh, that could be done to facilitate uh, participation uh, or take up difficulties in parsing the documents or uh, whatever else? The, no, the main difficulty is due to the lack of annotations. Uh, only teams that can have methods uh, with unsupervised learning could participate. So one way to, uh, to lock down this uh, problem is to provide annotations. And perhaps that for the second round, we will provide um, not a gold standard annotations for the training test, uh, for the training data set, but at least a kind of uh, baseline system in order to provide with a few annotations. Uh, even if they are not perfect, it could be a good starting point for uh, supervised systems. Yeah, I think that, that would be really, really useful and also help uh, newcomers in the sense uh, 
if I correctly understood from previous uh, uh, emails, uh, Daniel is, uh, is a student and uh, so, for example, having a baseline system uh, could have uh, helped him uh, uh, a lot in, uh, in bootstrapping uh, his, uh, his project. Exactly. Uh, Cyril, uh, Pierre, Thierry, we have another question from uh, this time from Manuela. Uh, could you please explain what you mean with data with context? Yes. Um, the current uh, corpus is uh, composed of sentences, such like, uh, like those sentences. Uh, but if we look at the, the two sentences in English, uh, they are not in the correct order, so we cannot uh, take into account uh, a context larger than the sentences. We cannot uh, have a, a look on the previous or the, the following sentence since they are not related in the, the, in the original text. So the context is very close to the sentence and not out of the sentence. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question or we move to the, uh, the next uh, presentation? I don't see any. So thank you very much, uh, Thierry, Cyril, Pierre. I think now we are moving to Mercedes and Miguel for the uh, task three on uh, machine translation. Yes, let me share the screen. Mm -hmm. Can you see the, the slide now? Yes, it's good. Okay, so. So I will start and later on Miguel will continue the presentation. Uh, we are presenting the overview of the machine translation task, which is the third task in the, in the evaluation. Uh, we are co organizing um, the Polytechnical University of Valencia and Pangeanic, where I work and Miguel is from the university. So uh, we released the, the training data the 23rd of October and the test data set was released the, the 20th of November and the submission deadline was the, the 2nd of December. We will present first the empty task. We will continue with the submission descriptions. We will present the results on uh, quality assessment that we perform, and we will finish with the conclusions. So can you pass to the next? Okay, the next. Uh, as Nicola presented before, we are focused on the um, COVID-19 related documents. And we, and we would like to improve the systems to, to, make it worth, uh, to make it work to different language pairs, uh, translating this information. Here you can see uh, some examples of, of the data related to sickness, vaccines, all what we are hearing nowadays. Can you pass to the next one? Uh, so the language pairs were always um, English as a source and translating to German, French, Spanish, Italian, modern Greek, and Swedish. Uh, as we said before, we would like to to, uh, to do next uh, more uh, language pairs in the next round. The categories are uh, for each one of the language pairs is constraint option that system should be trained only with the provided data by the organizers. And if you submit uh, to one language pair, you have to, to do a submission of, of this option, compulsory. And the other option is unconstrained that you can add any external data and resources to, to this system. 
and this option is optional. Can you pass? Um, this is the corpora size that we provided. S stands for the number of sentences, T for the number of tokens, and V is the size of the vocabulary. As you can see, the training is not very big. So this is a low resource uh, conditions. The validation uh, changes the size depends on the language. Uh, it, it was depending on the ability of the of the resources and the test data set was selected the, according to the sentence alignment scores that um, uh, I think um, Basilis presented before. And we selected 2,000 of sentences according to these scores. Can you pass? So the evaluation uh, was according to LE as the main metric and CH CHRF for uh, additional metric, automatic uh, metrics, both. And we will uh, we um, studied the statistical significance according to approximate randomization testing to specify the clusters of in the ranks of the results of the systems. Okay, can you change? So now I will continue with the submissions that have been done. Um, the organizer submitted uh, two baselines. One is a standard transformer and the other is a standard RNN uh, system. We train the systems with OpenNMT PI toolkit and we have chosen 32K BP units as a standard option. Okay, so now I will continue with the participants' approaches. Uh, PROM uh, submitted uh, systems for all the languages and, and constraint and unconstrained options. This team have concatenated all the data from all the language pairs that have been provided by the organizers. Uh, they added a language tag uh, to the source to specify the, the target language. They use transformer architecture using the, the Marian NMT toolkit for training the models. They use 8K uh, vocabulary size made uh, with sentence piece. And for unconstrained option, they use um, 16K BP units. Uh, they didn't use the, the joint option for the BP, for the Greek uh, language due to the different scripting, and they aggregated uh, Opus and WMT data to, to this option. The next one is, yeah, to, the, there were two teams of a CUNY a group from the University of Prague. One is CUNY MT, that they, this team used online back translation. Uh, so this adding synthetic um, data to the constraint option. <laughs> and they use transfer learning with fine tuning of a low resource child model. So, so they were, as they describe in the report, they were uh, doing fine tuning to, to another language pair from another, from a previous language pair and, and trying to find better results in this way. They built also um, 
a multilingual model uh, of the Latin languages due to the similarities. These are Spanish, French, and Italian. So these were the, the three submissions they did for, for constraint option. And they train the models using transformer architecture and the XLM toolkit, building the, the vocabulary with 30K BP units. And the other group, CUNY MTR, MTIR, uh, used uh, transformer architecture as well, using Marian NMT toolkit and 32K BP units. This, should, this usually is the standard. And for unconstrained option, they, they added the UFAL medical corpus. The next group, yes, this team was LC, Lingua Custodia. And they use a multilingual model not using Greek due to the script. They added also the language tag in the source and used fine tuning for the language per corpus. Um, they use also transformer architecture with the sec to sec pi toolkit. And uh, yeah, this is bigger vocabulary. 30 50k for single models and 70k for the for a multilingual model uh, made with uh, sentence piece. They found more improvements for German using the multilingual model and not much improvement for French. The next group is Lindsay. They used uh, also 32K BP units and transformer architecture. But they, the, the new thing they did is to add uh, the, the BERT um, language model as an as additional embedding using the FERSEC toolkit. So the, the next one is Tarjama AI team. They submitted single models trained with all the language pairs. So they also added the language token for, for other languages, but the desired language is kept untapped. This is not a multilingual model that can translate to all the languages. They did a single model for each uh, language pair, but they use all the, the language pairs data. And they finally oversampled the desired target. Yeah, they, they oversampled the, the single model with the, the target language specified. Uh, data and the next the next model the the next team is e translation that we have received a, a small report from them that they described their uh, German submissions they use the transformer as well and Marian NMT toolkit for the German constraint option, they use transfer learning and 12K sentence piece. And for the unconstrained, they added WMT. Well, they, they just use directly the, their uh, submission of the WMT system. So yes, and, and they fine tune, they did another sub, uh, submission fine tuning with the constraint data provided by us. And for French uh, submissions, we don't have ma a lot of information. They only know what I wrote here. <laughs> that is the description of the systems. And the same happens with Accenture. 
they grow that they used a multilingual BART model. And now Miguel will continue with the results. Yeah, thank you, Mercedes. So here is the results for the constraint English German. First of all, as we were mentioned before, uh, we computed the statistical difference and what we did is to create different clustering for ranking results. So in a way that uh, participants in the same cluster have no, no statistical difference between one another. So for the constraint English German, we have 12 different systems from six participants. And the best approaches were based on transfer learning, a standard RMT with web translation, and multilingual RMT, which basically is from, from Blunt and the CUNY MNT. And also we can see with both baselines that most approaches, most complex approaches, let's say that that, are on top of our transformer baseline. And the <clears throat> uh, RNN baseline, sorry, makes a, a difference in a drop of quality from one ranking to another there are fewer drops in the translation quality, but around this point, the, the drop is higher. The English French is it's similar. The blonde multilingual is the, provides the highest results. And also the best approaches are multilingual, transfer learning and NMT with back translation. Um, something similar with the Spanish. Um, always multilingual goes first. And the, the baselines, their RNN baseline makes the, the difference in the drop of quality. In this Italian, it's similar, five different systems from four participants. Um, best approaches were multilingual NMT and transfer learning. And English model Greek, it, this, this language pair was the one with, with fewer participation. And again, the best approaches are multilingual NMT and, and Russian learning. And English Swedish behaves similarly. Again, seven different systems from five participants. And again, the best approaches is, is multilingual NMT and transfer learning. And now moving to the un unconstrained systems. It's, it's similar uh, once more, the multilingual system and also the WNT that as Mercedes mentioned before. We know is the system that a translation submitted to the WNT, but we don't have many details about how it was trained. And the unconstrained English phrase, uh, a different system for participants. And again, we see multilingual and in this case, transformer and reads with external data from Yopus and WMT. And the unconstrained English Spanish, in this case, we only have two, two submissions. And for the English Italian unconstrained, we have a single submission, the same from English to Mother Greek. And finally, from English to Eden, we have the similar submissions, a multilingual system. And, and the one with transformer and reads with in-domain data. So let's move now to quality C assessment. Since the corpora, as it was mentioned on, on the beginning, was created from, from Crowley, um, aligning the sentences, we wanted to, to make sure that the quality of the reference is good enough so that this evaluation makes sense. So what we did was with the help of a team of professional translators, we selected 500 uh, segments from Spanish and the translator post-edited them. So we re-evaluated the submissions using both the, the reference and the post-edition. Well, first we compared the, sorry, let me. First we compared the reference and it's posited versions using translation error rate. We had a value of 18.8, .8, which it's, a, it's not a very high value. And then we conducted again the Spanish evaluation using from only the those 500 segments from the participant submissions. 
um, as you can see, the results are fairly similar. The using evaluating with a reference produces a higher value, but that makes sense since the training corpora, the style of the training corpora is more similar to the reference than the posterior versions. And finally, as conclusions, the first round addressed six different language pairs and was divided into constraint and unconstrained. We have uh, eight different teams participating. The most successful approaches were based on multilingual MT and transfer learning. And um, pro MT approach was the one with place on top most of the time from in all language pairs except for the unconstrained English German and the constrained English German in which case they serve the first position with CUNY MT. And their approach was using a multilingual system using all language pair. We, we have uh, several teams using multilingual systems, but this one was the only one that used all language pairs. And also use a smaller vocabulary and sentence speed instead of BP. And in general, the difference between systems from one rank and the next one is small. And, the, and as I mentioned before, the RNN baseline delimits the point in which there is a significant drop of translation quality between ranks. And that's it, if you have questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mercedes Minguel, for uh, the nice presentation. Yeah, I, I would like to, go to add some comment. Please do, yes. <laughs> Yeah, just, just some, an open question is that I'm realizing that unconstrained systems that they just add uh, more external data, they get a lot of more points, like maybe 10 points. Um, yeah, only, yeah. only adding, <laughs> adding data. And yeah. even, yeah. even in, the, in the German, in the yes German English German that e translation even didn't use our uh, data in mm -hmm. the submission they translate they submitted they got thirteen points more than the first one in in constraint mm -hmm. so even not using yeah this would be the second system here that we can see even not That's using good. our data they mm -hmm. get 10 points more than if you go to the constraint. Yeah, here is 44. And yeah. Here we see that the best one is yeah. around 31. Yeah. So, so how do you explain this, uh, Miguel uh, Mercedes? Is it because uh, they, they also crawl their own data and it happens that uh, the data covers the same topics, the same terminology, or? No, it's, it's the WMT, so it's more news. I think okay. no. yeah, it's so in this case domain. it's clear. It's not even in domain. So so I mean that the results depends a lot of the amount of data because the constraint data okay. is almost one million, I think. And the WMT, I guess, is millions of of sentences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but also Mercedes, we aren't sure about this WMT system, which domain it is. Because I think there's also a medical domain category in WMT. Yeah, could be. So maybe it is the yeah. same domain, but yeah. yeah, the thing is we are not, we don't have many information about mm. the, the system. In WMT we, biomedical, uh, sorry, uh, in the WMT biomedical submission, there was the EMEA data which is also part of MLIA data. So that might be a reason. OK. Did you okay, hear what Sadaf said? Yes, yeah, so maybe yeah, it that's... could be the WMT medical task. Could... Yeah, because they, they are also using EMEA corpora mm, yes. as part of mm -hmm. this data comes from EMEA. So it is the, the same domain, more or less. And that also yeah. explains why fight tuning doesn't make a, a big difference for them. And the, 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 critical, the critical issue is uh, if they uh, crawled the same uh, type of data, I can't remember when we had our cutoff data uh, crawling for the, uh, this task, 
but you can imagine that they do have some of the test data into their training data. This could be a possibility that in what they use to train their system, it comprises some of our uh, test data. I don't know. I think it's, that's difficult because yeah, I, you know, they, they, we did a new crawling. Okay. Um, I don't know what they, if, if they could use this before. I don't know. But the WNT was one month ago, so I, I'm not sure. Yes. So that's there is basically a, there is a paper uh, explaining uh, e-translation WMT participation in mm, okay. I think basically they participated to the news task and to the um, there was a new task uh, now uh, on how easy the systems adapt to new types of uh, data and this is a DGT system, uh, yes. Alessandro, a translation. Okay. Yes. So I don't think they uh, they use the medical data. It's just uh, yes. indeed the amount of data. Yeah. And maybe uh, uh, test sets are a little bit different than the training data. This may be another explanation. Uh, you you mean in, in our case? Yes. Okay. Well, technically they are from the, they came from the same way. And we also try when selecting the, the segments to, to use as a test, we also try to make them as similar as possible as the yeah. training data. Uh, then we, we have to put even more data into, yeah. into this task. Okay. So we, we all remember the, uh, the statement that goes back to uh, Fred Jelinek, uh, for those who remember him, uh, the best data is more data. So I think uh, the more we have, the better. One thing that mm -hmm. I can't understand is when you post edit the, um, the, uh, the data, if you go back to this slide, yeah. Yes. We we uh, we all assume that uh, the uh, neural network based MTs uh, will have a better fluency, uh, and and uh, when I look at the blue, it goes down, at least one or two points down. You mean How with the posterior person? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's probably because mm, the training data. It's more similar to the reference. As we were mentioning, the, the tests are similar to the training data. Mm -hmm. So the NMT systems are learning to translate in the same style as in the in the reference. Okay. Also, I, I forgot to, to add it here, but the, transla uh, the translator mentioned that the sentence were more or less good, but uh, Hey, Mercedes, do you remember exactly what they said? Because there were some fewer changes that they made. What what the, the post editor said? Yeah, I think it was mostly some. Yeah, they were saying, she said that the, the quality was good in general. Just few literal things that the machines that um, this was uh, her comment. OK. Yeah, well, it, my comment, pre, uh, my previous comment, it was because I'm a bit disappointed with all the domain specific uh, techniques that we are trying to apply and improve the results. So if you just add more data, you get yeah. better results. Yes, I don't know. Yeah, well, the question uh, is so when, when this uh, performance get a symptotic uh, value where the, you can add, but then what you gain is, uh, is a, a tiny uh, percentages. Yeah. And then if you bring in adapted data, do you make a breakthrough in, in, in the performance? Do you really increase it substantially? I think this is a, 
a research topic that one should address uh, outside of this uh, outside of this uh, challenge. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Nicola, do you see any uh, comment in the um, in the uh, YouTube part? No, no, no. Okay, so then I will stop sharing the screen. Okay, thank you. So, can we move on to the next uh, overview? Yes. Semantic search task. Yes, here I am. So I will start sharing the screen. Just give me one second. Okay. You can see, right? Yeah. Good. Thank okay. you. I'll go full screen. Okay. So this is going to be a joint presentation. I will start and then I will give the floor to Maria more or less. Screen, Giorgio. You have Sorry. You have to go to full screen. It's we see the window screen. Uh, I I went full screen. Okay, so that that that's the way we still see the bars of. Uh, Can you still see it? Yeah, but does it? Okay, matter? okay, okay. So I'm not going full screen on. So so if if it's the same, I'm not going full screen. Okay, so um, uh, as I was saying, I will give the floor to Maria more or less at, at half of this presentation. And this is the overview. So I will first introduce how we um, managed to uh, collect all the data that uh, uh, all the colleagues of this uh, uh, evaluation activity uh, gave us and provided us uh, about collection of the topics, how we created the topics, and how the participants, how many participants we had, and how we created uh, the pools for relevance judgments. And then at the end, in the second part, we are going to to say something about the um, how we evaluated the runs, the participants, and some insights and some ongoing work. So just a reminder of these, let's say, more traditional IER task. Uh, this was um, that was our statement. This task was to collect relevant information for the community, the general public, as well as other stakeholders when searching for health content in different languages and different levels of knowledge. Part of having different users with different levels of knowledge is going to be uh, evaluated in the in this week's and in the next rounds as well. Uh, we uh, decided to go for two subtasks. One, it's a more classical IR task, IR uh, ad hoc multilingual search task, more focused on high precision. And then also we um, we uh, also provided. Uh, different, let's say, subtasks more oriented towards high local system. Since uh, Loren Aguero is here, we, uh, we had a lot of suggestions from this e-health uh, task about technology-assisted review systems. And as you can see, uh, in the first subtask, we uh, set up some ground rules, which are more or less, let's say, standard in IR, where you can retrieve 1,000 documents per topic. While for the uh, subtask two, we decided to go for a smaller pool of documents because we wanted to mimic a, a real situation where you have a uh, um, short amount of time to read the actual documents and maybe you do not have enough money uh, to pay people to read these documents. So it's a, uh, it may seem a little bit counterintuitive to have less document in a high recall system uh, task, but it is actually a real world problem where you have a limited amount of time and a limited amount of resources. So uh, we decided to, to give participants the opportunity to submit uh, at most five monolingual uh, runs per language uh, and five bilingual, run, five bilingual runs per pair of languages per subtask. Uh, the collections are the ones that um, you saw at the beginning of uh, these uh, of this afternoon uh, presentation. So we we went for these uh, eight languages. When we started to think about 
why to choose these languages apart from the availability of collections we also wanted to cover what was happening around april may june where uh, there were some of the countries like italy and spain that were hit uh, harder than others at that time uh, by the covid spread outbreak uh, while keeping also alternative situations like uh, Sweden and Ukrainian, where they decided, and also at that time Germany, where the situation was different, and also the the political actions were different, according to uh, that time. So uh, those are the uh, collections that we used, and as you can see, in some cases we have almost perfect uh, bilingual uh, or multilingual and parallel uh, collections like uh, the European, the URLEX or uh, Wikipedia, we can say it's uh, an almost uh, parallel corpora. And we have the Medicis collection, which is the largest ones by far, which contains a lot of English documents as you may expect. It. And as you can see, there are uh, many documents concerning Italy and Spain that at that time we we're talking about uh, uh, time period which went from December 2019 and up to April 2020. So at, at that time, Italy and Spain were almost on any news, being one of the countries uh, hit more by COVID. So it, it's an unbalanced uh, set of collection if you see it from, uh, from a language perspective, but we had plenty of uh, data to work with. So uh, we were happy about that and we are thankful to Stelius and all his group for collecting all, the, all these documents. For the topics, we decided to go for um, um, a part of topics to uh, recreate what uh, Trek COVID did um, a few months earlier. So a subset of the queries that, that the participant received are actually the Trek COVID queries. And another part were selected, uh, and I really thank Nicola for that, Nicola for that, because uh, we, uh, we had to go through uh, some queries collected by the BIM search data set for coronavirus intent and see what, what was uh, on that time period, the most frequent or the most interesting uh, queries issued by users. So we selected uh, some of them and then we uh, translated them. Now, the, the, the topics are uh, structured in a sort of track like uh, way. So we have a keyword uh, description of the query, like surgical mask protection, which you may think of it as what we usually write on a search engine uh, text uh, box when we search for something. And also we try to write it, rewrite the same keyword uh, query in a more conversational way, such as if you speak to any uh, um, home device asking for, does a surgical mask protect from COVID-19? So it's a sort of question to, to mimic what may happen if you ask the same thing in a more uh, natural language way. And the explanation is usually uh, added for assessors or for trying to explain in a more detailed way what we mean by this very uh, synthetic uh, query like keyword or conversational. So topics were translated from English to all the other seven languages of the collection, like let's say the official collections. And also we had uh, two alternative uh, translation in Chinese and, uh, and Japanese as well. Uh, so we, uh, we have 25 participants registered for this task and four of them submitted at the end runs for this task. And these are listed just by in order of ID. So we had Charles University, Sheffield, Padua and Caen. And this is the breakdown of uh, submissions per language and per, uh, per participants. And so uh, if you see the last column, the total uh, runs submitted by all the participants, we covered, if you see the total column, you have the first number refers to the number of monolingual runs. The second number is the bilingual runs. 
So we covered all the monolingual, all, all the languages for the monolingual uh, task for subtask one, and just English, French, and German for the bilingual uh, part. At the end, we had around 95 uh, runs uh, submitted. For subtask two, we had um, many languages, but we missed Greek, Swedish, and Ukrainian for both uh, monolingual and uh, bilingual subtasks, and also Italian for the bilingual. But at the end, we received a, a reasonable uh, number of uh, runs for, uh, for this subtask as well. Uh, in order to pull the documents for relevance judgment, uh, we went for a let's say a standard uh, top K documents pulling per run. So we try to tweak these numbers. So we, we, uh, we took all the runs for the monolingual subtask one, monolingual subtask two, bilingual subtask one and bilingual subtask two. And we try to change this value K which indicates that the first K documents for each run is going to be evaluated. So if you read the first line for English, we selected the, first, the top 15 documents for the monolingual subtask one, the top 15 for the monolingual subtask two, and five, five for the bilingual subtask. In order to reach something in between 6,000, 8,000 documents. Now, uh, since the time was very short to do all the assessments, so we, with, I, I really thank all the assessors who participated in this, uh, in this task all the guys, all the students, uh, all the people, a uh, big award to Thierry de Klerk who did all the German assessments. So if you have something against the German pool, go to Thierry, but I'm joking, of course, thank you very much. You did a great job. So uh, at some point in time, since we wanted, we did not want to delay uh, too much the, the evaluation part, we had to cut some of the pools and we decided to go at some point to, uh, um, to reduce the pool in order to have all the runs evaluated at least at top five. Okay, so if you can see again, the, the first row, we uh, ideally we had 8,247 documents for the English pool, but at some point we had to, to stop and to reduce it. So we achieved this number, which is around 7,200 uh, relevance assessments. And, we are planning to, to complete all the pools in, in the second round. So also you can see the number of assessors uh, per pool. So a really big, big, big thank to all the assessors who participated in this part. So at this point, I think I can uh, give the floor to Maria for the second part. I don't yeah. know. If, if you can continue sharing, yes. that's uh, yeah. fine. Yeah, you just tell me next yeah. and I will share. Sure. Sure. So uh, the next uh, couple of slides give a bit of an overview of what kind of ground truths we have collected and what kind of results uh, we can already see. So on this graph, there are um, uh, two bars per each uh, language, the number of all documents that were assessed. So it's the red bar and the in blue, you can see the number of relevant documents. And uh, uh, you can see that for um, um, well, for all of the uh, languages, it's less than 50% of the documents were relevant. But so for Swedish and Italian, uh, it was uh, around one third of the documents were relevant. And uh, something for us to explore further and to investigate is that, for example, for Swedish language, we had uh, some topics for which only one or two documents were uh, judged as relevant while uh, the system were systems were retrieving like 200 documents. So it's a question whether uh, it's the data set that is, um, so the difference lies in the data sets or it's the systems and their retrieval performance. Um, so that's some open questions here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in terms of uh, looking at the uh, results, we um, calculated a number of uh, metrics. So to have different perspective on the uh, results list. 
So for subtask one, we looked especially at the precision at rank five. So how many relevant documents you find at the uh, top uh, top of the results, and also um, normalized uh, discounted cumulative gain uh, gives us the idea of. Um, uh, the uh, retrieved uh, list itself, but it penalizes the documents that are relevant, but are found uh, lower in the list. So it gives you a general idea of the, how good the retrieved list is and how uh, much high to the top, uh, how much higher to the top you have uh, more of the relevant documents. And for subtask two, because it was more focused on the recall. So we looked at the recall values and the R precision. So which also takes into account the total amount of the uh, relevant documents. Um, so we can now go to the next slide. Um, this is a bit of an overview of the general um, features of the systems that were uh, uh, submitted. So the in terms of the core of the systems, there was uh, Elasticsearch, Lucene, Terrier, and then uh, a number of approaches were used. And it's the keywords, lexical search, the query expansion, the formulation, the rank fusion and re-ranking. And uh, well, we let the participants themselves uh, give more details of the systems. But uh, we can, thanks, uh, Georgia, for uh, looking at the results. So um, on this graph, you can see the results for the monolingual runs and uh, for, uh, we focus on the languages here so that you can get a broader uh, view on how system performed. You can see that for English, uh, there, are, there is a variety of results, but for, uh, and for Spanish also, there is a broader variety of the uh, um, scores. While for other languages, well, the systems uh, might, so there might be different settings of the systems, but the scores are um, pretty close between themselves. And then the next uh, slide gives you the uh, NDCG uh, value. So uh, again, getting more uh, the overview of the whole list of results. So here you can see that, um, so uh, the brands for French, German, Greek, Italian, and Swedish performed overall better than the runs for Spanish. So that's uh, some interesting uh, exploration is to be done and to, to, to see what caused the difference across the languages uh, for this search results. Um, then, uh, yes, the, the, uh, this um, slide gives an overview of the uh, subtask one, but for bilingual runs. And here we have actually a lot of runs for different language combinations, but they are all uh, provided by one group. It's from Charles University of Prague. And uh, I've seen that Pavel is in the uh, list of participants. So maybe he can give some comments because it's interesting to see that in terms of precision at rank five, the, uh, all, all the, for all the language combinations, the system uh, so the run four, so the approach four gives uh, more or less comparable results. While when we look at the uh, NDCG values for the same runs for the same uh, language combinations. So this uh, run four, uh, that's uh, not, uh, well, not, not as uh, well performing as the others. So that's, um, again, currently we put together the overview and uh, we are more interested to hear from the participants um, what, uh, cost this uh, difference in scores. Um, then uh, the for the second subtask for the uh, more recall oriented uh, run. So we have here less languages, but again, it's the same overview per language. So here you can see that uh, for some of the systems, uh, like for example, for German, uh, the uh, two different approach uh, provide uh, from different groups provide very uh, varying results. So like uh, the IMS runs uh, are way different from the uh, Sheffield results. So that's uh, interesting. While the other um, runs are clustered in parts. So that's um, something to see. Then uh, the on the next slide, we have the recall. Well, in terms of recall, uh, most of the systems are 
uh, barely reaching 0.5. So uh, that's at least there is consistency. And then you can see that in terms of recall, uh, Spanish runs are um, lower than uh, uh, give, give uh, lower scores than uh, the others. And uh, the last slide of the results, uh, yes, it's with the R precision, but well, it's similar um, um, spread of results as for uh, as with the recall. So you can see again that uh, there is certain clustering per language for Spanish runs while uh, German and French, depending on the approach, so different systems show diff really uh, different scores. So it's interesting to see um, in more details, um, the talks of the participants, uh, what worked and what did not work uh, for their runs. And the next slide. So the ongoing work, uh, of course, from us uh, as the organizers from our side. So we still need to do the assessment of the runs for Ukrainian language because currently they are missing in this overview. Uh, we need to check the results outliers. So as I said, like, for example, the fact that uh, for some of the topics, there is only one or two uh, relevant um, documents, uh, while for the other languages, there are much more relevant documents for the same topic. Then uh, we also need to see whether the results uh, are different, uh, depending on what type of uh, topics we have, like because we took topics from uh, two different uh, sources, so whether a uh, system performed differently, and also the types of information requests that are expressed in different topics. So that's more uh, analysis is to be done across uh, the system. And of course, uh, together with the teams, uh, we want to see what's uh, worked and what did not work uh, in terms of um, different approaches per language. Uh, because, uh, yeah, again, there are outliers or there are differently, uh, definitely for some languages, uh, some systems perform better. So that's, uh, I think that will be our next iteration of the report uh, will highlight that. And uh, that's uh, our overview. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Mm. And I see there is a question yeah. from Lorraine in the chat. Yes, are the you base... want to take it? Uh, yes, I'm just reading it. Are the baselines uh, showing similar performance tendencies as participants runs across languages? Well, we don't really have baseline, Oof. Um, official baseline. Yeah, I was thinking about that. That's, uh, I do not have an immediate answers for that because uh, uh, it's, uh, I mean, I try, I try to formulate it correctly. I, we, since we did not uh, set up uh, a baseline common for, uh, for all, the, all the participants, I looked into all the, all the experiments, but I, since the systems are different and the, and the text preprocessing is not exactly the same, uh, I would say that it's, mm, I do not have a clear answer uh, for that. Uh, so it's part of the uh, ongoing analysis. And, and this gives me also the opportunity to add just one more thing uh, about a comment. So for example, let's see uh, this subtask to it, but it's the same. So a uh, great job from Sheffield. Uh, but then if you look into it, uh, they, uh, they, they could do it. It was just, uh, uh, my, uh, my, it's not a mistake, I, I missed just one point. So I forgot to ask, we forgot to ask uh, the participant to, to tell explicitly whether the run was using just the keyword part of the topic or the conversational part of the to topic or both. So uh, it resulted that using, uh, merging both the keyword and the conversational part, uh, you could obtain uh, much better results. So there is a big difference between uh, Sheffield and all the others, and that's fine. But most of the difference is given by the fact that uh, the, um, Sheffield used also the conversational part, and also they also did a great job in re-ranking. So it's just not the fact that they are using more keywords or more, more terms uh, to the uh, to the query, but that, that's a big part. So 
about the baseline, so going back to Lorraine, we will give you a better explanation probably between round one and round two when we, we will try probably the same baseline for all the, all the combinations. And I think also for the ground truth, it's important yeah. uh, to notice that, I mean, for some of the languages, we have only one group submitting uh, the runs, so we have much less variability. Uh, so I would expect, of course, the next runs to create uh, more diverse ground truth and maybe more interesting than our uh, parameters for results. Thank you. There is another question from Pavel. Uh, Pavel, maybe I'm giving you the uh, the floor to introduce yourself since you didn't get the chance to do it when we started. Just a couple of words about uh, what you do and where you are. Hi, oh, can you hear me, please? Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I joined late uh, because of some uh, duties I, I had, so I didn't uh, uh, attend the first two meetings, so sorry about that. Yeah, I'm uh, working at the Charles University with a group of people focusing on cross-lingual IR. So the um, Charles University MTIR team, that's that's our team, and we mainly focused on uh, the English monolingual runs and bilingual runs from non-English to English. Uh, yeah, and we will have a, a presentation tomorrow, I think, about about our approach. It was mostly baseline uh, baseline experiments, uh, and nothing really fancy because we didn't have much time to uh, to do something advanced uh, just because of time constraints. And yes, yeah, very, very much for all, for all this effort. Thank you very much, Pavel, and uh, looking forward to your talk tomorrow. The question was then: uh, Were the re relevance assessors domain experts or not? Did uh, you try to estimate inter-assessor agreement? The question is for you, Maria and Giorgio. Okay, so I can speak for uh, I, th I think all uh, for all the puts we have we had native speakers apart from English. So uh, and we are guilty. I mean, uh, we as organizers and group for English, but for all the other languages, we have all native uh, speakers. Uh, for uh, I can speak clearly for Italian. They were students of the um, of a um, translation course here at the University of Padua for Italian. So they they are not experts, but they were prepared to this um, to this task by translating medical documents. So they are actually not experts, but they were expert in translating Italian to English documents or Italian to any other language. That's for Italian. For English, it, it's just us. So uh, we can consider us experts in IR and I don't think in the medical uh, part. So uh, I would say that in general, we did not have uh, the effort to have experts unless the Swedish and Greeks uh, no, guys. No, I, okay. I think, uh, I mean, the, the purpose was also to have the assessors yes. of the type of general audience. So we had, uh, where possible, native speakers, and uh, um, then they have no medical background, or mm -hmm. I mean, they might have their own medical interest, but not nothing that we especially required. Yes. Yeah. And then the other thing about interassessor agreement, we could not uh, have that estimate because, given the time constraints and the and the budget and, and whatever you may think of. We had just to split all the documents. So none of the documents were done more than once. So uh, this is part of a uh, future work maybe. One of the participants, which is actually Padua, uh, used um, a sort of crowd relevance assessment given by the same students before and after so tomorrow you will see some ideas about inter-assessor agreement for the uh, Italian part. So that, that's the most we, we could do uh, by exploiting students in doing this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But this is part of future work probably about, and if we have more people or more budget or more time to do that, we are, we are very willing to do this uh, agreement, inter-assessor agreement analysis. So if I can add something to that, uh, yes. so or maybe have uh, another question. So did you pay the assessors or were they volunteers crowdsourcing or? 
So for English, French, German, uh, Italian, and Greek, if I'm not wrong, uh, who, who, yeah. Swedish? And well, for Swedish, well, they were paid, but uh, okay. uh, yeah, they were the assessors. But, uh, I, I don't think that, that yeah. financial motivation was mm -hmm. uh, having any impact on the results. Yeah, I think that the, the uh, the answer is that some or most of the uh, assessors were part of the different staff, uh, members of different institutions. So they were paid because they were employed, but yes. they weren't paid mm -hmm. because they were doing this job. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I don't think we forced anyone to do that. I think mm -hmm. uh, Thierry did it uh, by himself. Uh, we didn't have to insist that much. OK, thanks a lot. No, I disagree with you. <laughs> but may, maybe if Pavel, your question was so there was no also like no crowdsourcing in the sense that uh, all the assessors got uh, personal uh, explanations uh, about the task. So it was not uh, run by a uh, external platform where we have no uh, contact. So if assessors had any questions. Uh, like in general, how to approach the task, they could ask us. Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay, yeah, I'm basically asking about the quality of the assessment. So maybe for future work, as, as you said, it would be nice to have some dual assessment, just a small portion, just yeah. to see, you know, what, what is the agreement and, to, you know, to, to make sure that uh, yeah. the quality is, is uh, acceptable, yeah. I would say. Yeah. yeah, thanks for that. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, if there is no extra questions, I think we are at the end of this first day. Uh, I'm very glad that we all uh, made it. Maybe uh, the final things would be that we uh, all open our uh, cameras to take a screenshot for, uh, for future uh, memories. I think to today, as you have seen, uh, day one is mostly the organizers uh, with the uh, European Commission uh, involvement. We introduced the context and the rational. Uh, we had the uh, data description. Uh, we had the uh, task descriptions uh, with uh, a focus on, uh, on uh, what we want to do. And I think that uh, there are still a number of things to uh, address uh, in, in future rounds, including for the cases where some data wasn't used in this uh, in this uh, first uh, first uh, phase. Um, one of the guys that didn't get a chance to talk is Vasily, who worked with Stelios on, on the data. So we're thankful that uh, he was uh, part of the uh, organizing team. And I think that we can now take a, a picture and then the last words will be Nicola's uh, words. Okay. I took the picture. Uh, I can just say thank you everybody for your participation and for uh, the discussion uh, today. Tomorrow, as Khalid said, will be uh, the turn of uh, the participants. We will start with uh, the multilingual search uh, task. Uh, as of today, the Zoom meeting will be the same, so same coordinates, same password, etc and also the live stream on YouTube will be the same, uh, the same link. The starting time will be different because we will, we will start a little bit uh, later. It's uh, 2.20, but there is no buffer. I mean, today we started at two with 15 minutes buffer for setup, uh, whatever. Tomorrow we will start at 2.20, but it will be the real start without any buffer in between. Thank you again, and have a nice evening to everybody, guys. Well, thank you to you. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.